Uh, I'd like to introduce Chris Horn. Uh, Chris Horn is a senior researcher at Secure Decisions. Secure Decisions is a cybersecurity research organization. Most of the work that they do is funded by either the Department of Defense or the Department of Homeland Security. In fact, some of the things that you're going to hear about today <coughs> is funded by an organization called DARPA, which really did invent the internet. Uh, se se secure Decisions uh, does a, a number of things with the results of the R&D. Uh, they uh, open source a number of projects, and uh, they also commercialize some of the results through the company that I run now called CodeDX. Uh, Chris has two research projects he's working on right now, at least two. One is on the human factors that affect secure code development. That's one of the things we're going to be presenting about. And the other thing he's working on is, is uh, benchmarking static code analyzers. And he's going to talk about that tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so I urge you to uh, go to his session tomorrow. Chris. Thanks. And this is Anita. So Anita is the CEO of CodeDX. And CodeDX, as she mentioned, is a spin out of secure decisions research. So one of the things we always try to do with our research is put it in the hands of the people that can use it. And uh, CodeDX is one of the more successful examples of that. So it started about eight years ago as a Department of Homeland Security uh, research project. It's been slowly built up, uh, bootstrapped. And um, now it's an independent company. And they have a booth in the corner over there. And you can go and learn all about it. Uh, but it's an application vulnerability management system. So its key capability is that it correlates the results from your security testing, puts it in a single pane of glass. and. Um, yeah, so Anita's doing that full-time. She's moved away from her role as Director of Secure Decisions, now full-time CEO. And uh, CodeDX also maintains two OWASP projects. So they're listed here. So CodePulse is a tool that's, so both of these actually originated as uh, Secure Decisions Research, but are now um, being maintained by CodeDX. And so CodePulse is a tool that helps you visualize uh, the real-time code coverage of your testing activities or any kind of dynamic execution of your app. And the attack surface detector, will, it'll enumerate all the public endpoints and their parameters for you. So if you're um, trying to seed your dynamic testers, you know, your dynamic tools with endpoints, you can do that. You can also hand it off to your pen testers and things like that. Saves them a huge amount of time on discovery and lets them actually focus their efforts on breaking your app rather than just figuring out what's there. OK, thanks, Chris. So let's get on with the show. Uh, today, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this is a different type of uh, talk than is usually given at these conferences because we're going to talk about the human element uh, as opposed to the technology behind secure code development. Uh, first, we're going to talk about why should we be looking at these human factors that affect code quality and code security. And then we're going to talk about how this research is actually done, followed by what some of the research findings have found. So what you're going to hear today is based on scientific evidence. Uh, and then they'll, we'll talk about other areas besides software engineering uh, that could inform uh, how you approach secure code development. And finally, it'll be the so what. How could you take the results of what we're talking about and apply it in your everyday life? So let's start with why. Well, software vulnerabilities are at a major gateway to most data breaches. In fact, the Verizon data report shows that 90% of data breaches in the information industry start with an exploit of a web application. So it's really important that we find the software vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, it takes a long time to discover some software vulnerabilities. The heart bleed took about two years after it was first uh, uh, inserted into, into the code to find it. The patchy stress vulnerability that was behind the Equifax took four years to discover. And there's academic research that's looked at a number of different open source projects and looked at the vulnerabilities that have been publicly disclosed. And on average, it takes two years after a vulnerability is, in, uh, is inserted into code before it is actually publicly disclosed. It may have been found before, but it may not have been disclosed. So two years, that's how long it takes. So what do we do about that? Well, there's static code analyzers, and they're supposed to find a lot of the security weaknesses. But there's been some very interesting work that's done by the National Institute for Standards and Technology. They benchmark all kinds of things in, in our world. 
in our, in our lives. And uh, one of the things that they did was they benchmarked static code analyzers, and they found that a single SAS tool, on average, finds only 14% of the vulnerabilities. They, what they did is they had test code, test applications with known vulnerabilities, 14%. But that each one finds a different 14%. Now you just have to combine them. Uh, now, some of them obviously do better than 14%, and some of them do worse. But they're, they're fairly unique. Uh, so what do you have to do? Well, you have to go back to manual code reviews. And where do you start looking? When you're looking at manual code reviews, like where do you look for security weaknesses? So where would you look uh, for these? And this is where we get to human factors. So could you use human factors, something about the developers that, or the team, or where the code was, was developed, to give you an insight as to where to hunt for vulnerabilities. Maybe there's something about the developer characteristics or the team, or what time of day the code was written, or where the code was written. So these are types of things we call human factors. So let's talk a little bit about human factors. So there's a number of different types of human factors. The first is psychological. And this could be individual, so it could be how easily you learn, or your ability to focus your attention, or how, how good your short-term memory is. That is a human factor that could affect your performance as a software developer, or as, or as anything, as, a, as an airline pilot. Uh, there's also group uh, psychological factors, such as how people collaborate, how they conflict with each other, how do they communicate, what are the cultural norms. Those affect human performance. Then there's physiological. So how tired you are, uh, how well you can keep up the pace of something. Do you have endurance? Uh, something called circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is the fluctuation of your body throughout the course of the day. There are certain levels of alertness that your body has that's based on certain chemical changes in your body. You know that 2 o'clock in the afternoon slump, right? That's a physiological thing called circadian rhythm. Hearing sensitivity, your health. People who have bad colds don't perform their jobs as well. So those are human factors. And then there's the environment. So it could be things like the lighting or distractions or noise in your environment, temperature. Uh, these can affect performance. Now, these factors are considered in almost all safety critical systems. Aviation, right? commercial driving, uh, healthcare. So why wouldn't they be considered in software where the software actually can be a safety critical system? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to start with how you figure this out. There's not a lot done in this area. So we're kind of on the cutting edge here. So in, in the beginning, right, when people started thinking about this, they looked at open source. So Rochester Institute of Technology is one place that's done a lot of this work. And in fact, when we did this, uh, the research that uh, we're going to talk about, some of it, uh, we teamed with Rochester Institute of Technology. So what they do, typically, is they take an open source project, and they look at all the files that have publicly disclosed vulnerabilities in them, and they make a pile. And then they take all the files that don't have publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. Doesn't mean they're not vulnerable, they just haven't found them. And then they, so they have these two piles and they go, what are the things that differentiate these? You know, what, is there something about the pile with vulnerabilities that makes it distinctively different than the non-vulnerable pile? Now, the, and they look at things that are indirect measures. So you can't really measure team size, but you can look at how many people contributed to the file. Uh, so you can't necessarily look at when they wrote the code, but you can do look at time zones depending on what you're looking, uh, which repo you're looking at, and you can infer the time of day that the code was committed. But there are no direct measurements. There also are some limited studies of proprietary environments. And so Microsoft, AT&T, they've published some work on human factors in in uh, software engineering. And we are performing 
right? So I just cycled off of this because I'm running CODEX, but Chris is now before me. <laughs> uh, research under a DARPA research contract where we're expanding the work that was done on open source to proprietary environments. And we're studying human factors directly as people code, not just sort of indirectly looking at repos that are several years old. So the way we're doing this is the first thing is called a retrospective analysis. It's basically the way that you study open source code. You get a big repo of software, and if it's open source, you go in, you figure out what might be a human factor that you could figure out in that repo, and then you correlate it to publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. We also are running static code analyzers on that code because there may be things, security weaknesses, in the open source that haven't reached the level of a publicly disclosed vulnerability but are still security issues. We also can do this on proprietary code. So we took code bases, a couple of code bases that were developed in a proprietary environment and we now are looking at those and we're looking at what are the security weaknesses that are found using SAST tools because there are no publicly disclosed vulnerabilities in, uh, in, in a proprietary environment. But also, when you look at proprietary code, there are things that you can learn about the developers that you can't learn easily in open source. For example, what's the experience level of the individual? Um, how, big was, how big was the team, really? Um, or time card information. Did they work more than 40 hours? Uh, how many more than 40 hours did they work? Did they splice their time across different projects, or did they focus on just one thing at a time? The second thing that we're doing is something called concurrent analysis, where we actually instrument the developer's work environment to study certain things. So one thing we do is in the morning, they come into work, a survey pops up and says, how many hours of sleep did you get last night? Right? So now you have a measure of sleep deprivation. Uh, we'll, we'll ask them two or three times during the course of the day, how fatigued do you feel? Because you can feel tired even if you got a full night's sleep. Um, we'll ask, we'll look at how many windows they have open and how they change their focus. You know, there are people who flit from one to another and people concentrate. So we can look at that. And then we correlate that to the security weaknesses that are found in SAS static code analyzers. And the last thing, real interesting, is called the vulnerability history analysis. Here, we go into open source, we take a vulnerability that's known and we trace its life story. So this vulnerability was found in, in, in 2016, in October 2016. When was it introduced into the code base? And then we say, well, now, now we found out that it was introduced you know, two and a half years before. What were the circumstances going on in that repo at the time that it was introduced? And what happened in that two and a half years? Like, was there no opportunity to find it is that there wasn't, nobody was working in that area of the code, or there were many people working in that area of code and nobody looked at it, right? But, so we're kind of trying to learn about it. So this is pretty different than the previous work that's been done. Um, so what we're trying to do is figure out through this work, what are the, can we predict where the vulnerabilities will be in the code? The predictors are human factors. So it might be a developer's ability to focus their attention or context switching. You know, you know what that is, right? Team size, team collaboration. Co-location is, is a group of developers who are working right in the same room. Do they write more secure or less secure code than developers who are a continent away from each other? Uh, time of day, number of hours worked. So these are the human predictors. And then the outcome measures are uh, publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, security weaknesses in the code, but also things like bugs. You can look at code quality, bug frequency, failure rates. So these are the types of things that we're looking at. Okay, uh, questions before I go on? Okay, so I'm gonna, oh, go ahead. I saw one predictor called file editing behaviors. Could you clarify that? Sure, actually we're gonna talk about that, but it is, there, there are measures of um, the way developers edit files called churn. So 
are you at the per, are you the kind of developer that's constantly going back to your code, editing, 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 or do you like hold everything back and then boom, like you know, you, you commit and then you don't touch it? What about people mucking around with other people's code? That's called interactive churn. You know, is is code where other developers are going and editing everybody else's code more or less secure? So that's what we mean by file editing. So let me tell you about some of the things that is in the literature. And by the way, at the end of this, there is a set of references. So you could actually look at the scientific citations. You'll see little um, uh, footnotes here, and they refer to something in the back. So first question, does team co-location influence code quality? Do you think that a team that works together in the same environment is more likely to write secure or insecure code. Do you think it makes a difference? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is a study that was done by Microsoft. <laughs> so we get we're just this, uh, and the answer: Microsoft study post-release failures in Windows Vista and in Office, and they compared the uh, the failure rates in co-located versus non-co-located teams, and they looked at all different levels of co-location. Are you in the same group? Are you in the same building, different room, share a cafeteria? <laughs> Are you on the same campus? Are you in the same region? Are you on different continents? Right? They looked at all those factors. The answer is no. It makes no difference. Uh, that there was no difference whether you were in the same building or you were across the world from each other. Microsoft doesn't represent the entire software industry, right? Excuse me? It's one study. Yes. It's one study. But very few people actually do this study. So now there is a factor that actually did predict or was correlated with the failure rates. It wasn't co-location. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Cliffhanger, right? <laughs> uh, time of day. Does time of day of when you commit your code influence the code quality or affect it in some way? Yes. 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 <laughs> Late night commits have more bugs than morning commits. That, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, you get buggy commits between midnight and 4. Um, it's higher than between like 7 a.m. and noon. <laughs> Some developers do, apparently. Um, and these are code commits, right? Yes. Uh, it, actually, most of this, this work is normalized for, for time zones. Yes. So then when you're looking at that, like I know that when we do studies of open source code, most of the time you can actually look at the time zone that it was committed, and then there's an offset. All right. There's like a couple of repos you can't do that, but most of them you can. Um, now, this is something which I looked at this, and as an experimental psychologist, I went, of course, right? Uh, because there's something called circadian rhythm. Uh, there are chemicals in your body called catecholamines that shift during the course of the day. And at the, uh, it, they're, they, they're very high, about 11 o'clock noontime. They come down at about 2 o'clock. You've had that post lunch dip, it's not because you ate, it's actually because your body is going down, it's behind siesta, that's why you have siesta. And then it starts rising again about three or four o'clock, and then it, drip, it dips down again at about 10 o'clock at night, and it stays down until about six, seven o'clock in the morning when it goes up. And you can study this across cultures, across, and it's one of the reasons that it's so hard for some shift workers to work at night. Because there, some people can actually change their circadian rhythm. Most people can't. And you're fighting your body clock. And, and these things are directly associated with performance in other industries, like driving, aviation. I mean, there's all kinds of places where you can see these effects. Why not? It's not surprising to me that it affects software development. OK, lack of focus. Now, this is a hard thing to measure in any case but especially if you're looking at open source. So there is a metric that is used to look at 
developer focused, and it's called unfocused contribution. So a file is considered to have unfocused contribution if either the developer of that file was also like almost simultaneously developing a, in a couple of other files. You could actually see that in, in repos. You know, this guy is, is working on this, but he's working on this, 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 and this. So, or when the number of unique contributors to a file goes up. So no one person is responsible for just focusing on that one file. That's called unfocused contribution. Does it make a difference? Yes, yes. yes it does. Um, that there's more unfocused, con the more unfocused contribution in a file, the more insecure the code. That uh, if you look at Chromium and Apache uh, web server files, those that have, remember I said there's a pile of files that have vulnerabilities and a pile of files that don't? The pile with the vulnerabilities, they have unfocused contribution. Either the developers of those were developing a whole bunch of other places at the same time, or they had a lot of different contributors. Now, we also looked at this in four repositories where we studied static analysis findings, so security issues and, and, and code quality issues. And we also found that there was a correlation between unfocused contribution and code and security issues found by static code analyzers. So, interesting. OK, another question. Does the number of developers who contribute to a file influence its code quality and security? Yes. Is it many eyes make good security? <laughs> Too many cooks spoil the broth? Yes, too many cooks spoil the broth. Remember I told you about Microsoft and how they studied all the co-location? Didn't make a difference. The thing that made a difference in post-release failure rates in, in uh, Microsoft code was the number of developers on the team. The more developers, the worse the code. <laughs> um, and so the more developers, the more security issues. So let's take a couple of examples. All right, now remember, pile of open source, one pile has vulnerabilities, the other pile doesn't, all right? Yes, you have a question? Normalization again, is this normalized for file size? Um, no. Okay, because more developers would outside file. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, and in fact, very interesting that in none of the research that we looked at, I think that they look at, at that normalization, but we're looking at that uh, and looking at defect density, right? Which would normalize, you could normalize for file size, like lines of code, things like that. Or you could uh, normalize for churn. I have another question, but I can save it. No, save. <laughs> Keep us all in suspense. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew? Yeah. Okay, Andrew is going to. Has a good question. So it better be good. <laughs> OK, so a pile of vulnerable, non-vulnerable files. Linux kernel. The source code files with nine developers or more were 16 times more likely to have a vulnerability than files with fewer developers. And the way you actually do this is you look at the files and you go, how many of these had one developer? How many had two? How many had three? And you actually look at the probability change until you get to a point where it flips nine developers Linux kernel. OK. What about others, Chromium and Apache? Chromium, nine developers or more, 68 times more likely to have a vulnerability. Uh, let's look at another one. I think this one is Apache. Apache web server with nine developers or more, 117 times more likely to have a vulnerability in them. And finally, we looked at the four projects where the source code files, but we looked at four projects and we looked at the static code anal analysis because we said, okay, you know, this is like vulnerabilities. You still have a small N, but what about looking at static code analysis? And there is, is a positive correlation between the number of developers and the static analysis findings. Does this yeah. simply mean that uh, more developers, more complex files? You know, more it complex could. Things. It could. But 
it's a very good question. We don't know. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm dying to hear what you have to ask. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I thought I understood that one way you could measure that is a bunch of people making contributions to the same file. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm now wondering how that's different from the number of developers working on a file. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you want to answer? Uh, I, would, I would say it's not entirely separate, right? They overlap. They, they overlap, but there is a distinct variability. So that we actually did that analysis where we looked at unfocused contribution and we extracted statistically the variance associated with um, the number of, of developers. And then we looked at unfocused contribution, and you still get positive effects. Okay. So it is something different. Yes. Is there a golden number of developers? I'm assuming Everybody wants to, to, to know that. that. Right. And, and we don't know the golden number of developers. In fact, I think it would be a very difficult thing to do because of the complexity of the files that that gentleman back there said, and the size of the files. Uh, but yeah, so we don't know, but I could tell you that when we've now, when this, this study has been done on a number of open source repos, the number that seems where things flip is, is nine. Why? I don't know. But, um, you know, so one, one theory is something called the bystander effect. That, you know, if only, three pe if only two people are developing code, you look at each other's code. Like three people, you go, it wasn't me, maybe it was you. Like, you know, right? as long as you get the four, it's like, well, didn't you look at it, right? <laughs> and, and there's something called a bystander effect where when you actually see, when, when there's a bunch of people who are witnessing something, everybody thinks that the other person did something about it. So that's just one hypothesis, right? It could be. Yes, sir. It does. It does. Yeah. Yes, sir. So does that sort of make the case for open source software aspect compared to like commercial off the shelf software? Sorry, it was it make the case for open source. Well, we don't. We haven't. It, there's very little research on the proprietary code, so you don't really know how it exhibits itself in proprietary code. Um, yeah. Yes. So I suspect you might get to this in your now. Is there a deterministic relationship here? So if I had a team with 12 people who are working on one file, should I now conclude that's too many? I've got to reduce it. You know, I mean, and I do get to that punchline at the end, but my feeling, having seen this data, is that I'd probably have, I'd, I'd focus them on, on, I would make them into smaller and smaller teams. Just, I mean, you know, you, you don't know for sure, but why not? <laughs> Uh, another question. Like if, uh, to his question, if the, the previous contributor is no longer contributing to the file, still correlates as the same the action of the code, you would think that that implies that the problem is lack of understanding of that other person's code. It very well could the be. the fact that there's more people mm -hmm. in It very well could be. Or the lack of the right. understanding of the relationships between that code and mm -hmm. other code. Now, I got to say that we actually thought about something, you know, when you look at something over a really long period of time, you know, 15 years, so we actually, when we did some of these analysis, broke it down into two-year segments, and you still see the same effect in just two years. And we even see some of it in a six-month effect. So the next question is, does this always have a bad effect? And I'm turning this over to Chris. I'm pretty sure you could guess the answer. You're going to address yeah, that. Yeah, we're going to address that. <laughs> Here. Ah, oh, thanks. So Nita asked, does, does this always matter? And I, go, I forgot which one of you were asked, but just, just saying, um, is a large number always bad, right? Would you refactor your code base? I might answer, maybe not, but probably, right? And so one of the challenges, oh, I cheated. So 
Anyway, so <laughs> bumped it. But what, one, of the, one of the challenges of this research is that there is differences, there are differences between repositories. So right, you study repositories A, B, and C, and you get one correlation, and you do D, E, F, and you get different correlations, right? So there, and so here, you know, I've got some examples that just go the exact opposite way. Um, so here we have four open source projects. You basically, you look at um, the lines of code that had a defect on them, right? And, and then you look at how many people contributed to those lines, right? And actually, it was, it's fewer, right? So if you're looking at the lines with a defect, there are fewer contributors to those lines, you know, get blame style, than those all the other lines. So that kind of flies in the face of um, the earlier correlation. And when you, they studied this software here, they were looking at modules. Um, in the software, and they looked at the number of developers in those modules, and they didn't find correlations with the bug fixes, right? So there's not more bug fixing happening in modules with more developers. And when you also do the same kind of thing, um, so here you build a model, and you try to predict, like, what are the factors that I can identify that will predict whether or not uh, a file, it is just a module file, it's always different. So if, whether a file has a problem. And when you add in the number of developers that modified that file, your prediction accuracy doesn't go up, which basically says, well, in terms of this regression, this doesn't seem to affect it, right? So that's saying that I don't see a correlation here between number of developers and files. So it's not always super clear cut. So I think you know, there's always some context. And another explanation might be that, well, quality and security is a little bit different. So some people are studying faults, some people are studying security, some people are studying bug fixes, and there's differences there. Um, developer experience, it's written into every job description, right? Everybody clearly thinks this matters. Um, there's some challenges with measuring this, right? So when you're looking at open source uh, projects, which is where a lot of this research has been done, you don't know the people behind the committers, right? So you know who's committing, but you don't actually know the person. So we have proxy measures for experience. So we look at uh, how many commits did they make to the repository, or how long have they been committing over time, right? So they've been contributing to this project for multiple years, or just a week. So do you guys think this one matters? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Um, so Microsoft here studied this. They looked at um, this idea of minor contributors. So if you, you take all the commits to a file and you, know, you look at what percentage of them each person made. And so if you have files where you have lots of people who make a relatively small amount of the total contributions to that file, those files have more trouble, right? So if you, this sort of suggests that you should structure your code bases in a way where people are kind of owners of a file and more responsible for for like that entire component. Um, and then uh, same kind of thing in open source here. Um, so this has found that more experienced um, developers measured by uh, you know, their commit frequency. So if they're committing daily and regularly to the files, they have fewer, fewer buggy commits. And um, what's interesting here is that if you look at the time patterns of the commits, if, you, if they look like day job people doing work on open source, they actually maybe make more bugs, which sort of lends credibility to the idea that there's differences between proprietary development and open source development, right? Maybe these two things aren't the same. Maybe somebody who's working voluntarily on their off hours versus like doing it for a job, maybe there's a different level of commitment there or attention to detail or pride or whatever, right? And this is the last one here of this section, but uh, this is that, that qu question about interaction. So how developers are interacting with one another through the code. And so churn is uh, just this idea of the, how much changed, right? And interactive churn is um, how much are, of the changes in a commit are, are a developer modifying code that was last touched by somebody else, not them, specifically not them. and. Um, you know, you can kind of imagine, like, if I, I make a commit and then you change it, you have to kind of ha learn what I did in order to not screw it up, right? So you'd kind of expect this to matter. So with that foreshadowing, you think it matters? <laughs> yeah, it does. So we find that when people are editing code that they didn't write, 
there's more likely to be vulnerabilities there. And we do the, that with this bucket analysis, right? So if you take all the files um, with vulnerabilities in their past and files without them, the files with vulnerabilities have higher measures of interactive churn than those without. And um, so, so this is that part where, you know, we say, well, you know, there's limitations on this existing research. There are, there's a lot of research in other fields where, you know, we should probably be bringing those factors in and considering them in software engineering. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of work done across medicine and transportation. Um, FAA publishes handbooks about uh, human factors in aircraft maintenance, right? So to reduce the number of mistakes that happen during maintenance, which then can lead to safety incidents. And so I have two here. One, some, one of those is the, one of these uh, physiological ones, the fatigue. And so we know that fatigue degrades human performance, right? Um, so if you look at people's performance on various tests, if they, they're, they've been not sleeping for a long time, it's, their performance starts looking like they're drunk, like literally like they're drunk. But actually, even 17 hours without sleep is not a long time, right? I mean, that, right? <laughs> that just means it's getting close to the end of the day, right. right? Yeah, I mean, if you wake up at 8 and it's midnight, you know, you're in that territory. Right. Um, this one's interesting. So, uh, you know, for med students, they don't let them, basically, long story short, they don't let med students work long hours anymore because the rates of uh, medical errors were too high, right? And if you're driving trucks, you're not allowed to do it for more than 11 hours at a pop, right? So why are, you know, so to sort of, and then, oh, the Navy, right? Navy's had some problems where, you know, they accidentally bump a missile cruiser into an oil tanker, you know? That happens. And 17, um, got to get it right, sailors have died, right? Um, in these types of incidents. And when you look at, look at the underlying causes, fatigue is one of them. These guys just aren't sleeping enough. Um, and so fatigue really matters, and we think you know, that should factor into software development. And so culture is another one here. So culture is very difficult to measure and define, um, but it's all the kinds of things we believe, how we interact with one another, our attitudes towards stuff. So if I, you know, absent any information, what would be my sort of, my, just my sense, right? Um, and in healthcare, we know that uh, you can measure this thing called safety culture. And there, so there's various uh, elements to this. There's a safety attitudes questionnaire that's been developed and refined over the years. And we know uh, there are certain properties that define what's considered safety culture. And um, organizations with high safety culture scores have better patient outcomes, right? Fewer people having complications and dying and m m basically just bad things, right? Um, and we know that, and also this was, a, the second one here is really an interesting study because they actually purposefully did interventions to improve the safety culture, right? To, they did interventions to change those specific safety attitudes kinds of things. And what they found is that patient outcomes improved over that course of that intervention, right? So that's a really strong study showing that, you know, you have kind of causal effects here. Like if I change this thing, then I see the thing I expected. And so we think, and you know, a lot of the talks in these types of conferences, um, people talk about security culture, and um, we think that that can really affect uh, the quality of software. And so what? So what? I got a mic. Oh, you got a mic. <laughs> Thank you. So what? What do we do about this? Well, we started out by saying, where would you hunt for vulnerabilities? If you were doing manual code reviews, you were looking for problems. Uh, look for code committed after midnight. Uh, <laughs> files with nine or more contributing developers. Uh, files where the developers did not have a lot of experience with the code base. It may be a senior developer, but they're not familiar with the code base. And files that have that high level of interactive churn where one developer is, is editing other people's files a lot. So those are things to look for. And then there's the management issues. So if you have a software development group, you know, what are some of the things that you might do to improve the likelihood that you would produce secure code? One is stop coding after 11 hours of work. No right? matter how much you think you're in the flow. Uh, and if you do have people committing code late at night, put an extra level of review on 
those files. Um, keep your developers focused on just a few things. Right? Don't spread them out over a whole bunch of stuff. Focus the attention. Um, limit the number of developers that are contributing to files so that you don't have, you know, everybody else thinks that somebody else has done it. Um, and more closely review the code that's committed by uh, developers who with little experience. I think I said that already. Um, and then finally, uh, introduce security culture. And this very well may have an effect to raise awareness. Just make people a little bit more c conscious of the fact that security is important. So um, that's our presentation. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me, come down to the Code DX booth. We're in the corner. Um, Curtis, raise your hand. Look for the guy in the funny shirt. Um, and, that's, and I'll be standing next to him. Um, and I also, uh, by, I don't know if I said this, by training I'm an experimental psychologist, so if you want to ask me other stuff, you know, uh -huh. go ahead. Uh, and then Chris is working on this, uh, actively working on this research now. And if you want to participate in this research, if you have a code repository that you'd like to analyze, or you have a development team that you'd like to have work um, with the researchers, uh, we're actively looking for people to participate in this research. And um, if you ask for a slide deck, you will see copious scientific <laughs> citations. <laughs> okay, that's it. Do we have any final questions? Wow, look at this group. Go ahead. That early at evening drinking is what? Bombers. 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 Peak. Yeah. Now, I, I, I forever wanted to call bullshit on this. <laughs> but like, have you guys done any research on the thing that does bombers peak? Yeah. No, no, no. I, 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 I don't know of any research on that. But I can tell you that I don't know if it's changed. But when I was in graduate school, there was there was some well known research where if you learned something when you were slightly drunk, yeah. you were more likely to recall it. I mean, you were slightly drunk. <laughs> so if you studied, so if you studied while, while you know, with a little buzz, you should take the test when you have a buzz. That's right. <laughs> All right. I Free advice. Free advice. Free advice. Like uh, were there any studies on uh, code quality where, when there are uh, mandatory reviews of the commits? Like That's peer a good reviews? question. You know what? I don't, I don't know of any like that. I don't know. Versus no reviews. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I was just wondering if there was a specific class of vulnerabilities that you guys were using for this research. Uh, we act that there wasn't a specific class of vulnerabilities we were looking at. However, uh, when we do the vulnerability history uh, a survey and we start looking at the vulnerabilities, we might focus on certain types of vulnerabilities. And the other thing is that our our, our grand scheme was that when we did the static analysis results, we would actually look at some of the tool codes that were found to see if this effect was more pronounced in certain weaknesses versus others. Um, but it became a hairy mess. I mean, it's just like, it was, it was very difficult to, to do this because you're doing it on commit, on commit, on commit. And the amount of processing that it took was enormous. So we not, didn't get down to the, like the SWE categories. That's what I really wanted to look at. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. But, but we thought we could. <laughs> a for effort. I don't know. Uh, yeah, any other thing? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, great talk, by the way, and uh, very entertaining and engaging. Oh, thank you. Um, I tap dance, too. And he, <laughs> he plays the violin. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, going back to the Microsoft example, there were two uh, results from the Microsoft studies. So uh, comment and then question. So Microsoft is geographically distributed. They know how to work well with mm -hmm. geographically distributed teams. And Microsoft is one of the pioneer in secure software development. So they do get some sort of secure coding training and mm -hmm. other stuff as well. So do you guys consider these other factors for your studies as well? Like They definitely influence, right? And my second question is, um, are you guys willing to focus on smaller teams which are not geographically distributed as part of your studies? For yours. 
So no, we haven't controlled for so other properties of software repositories. That's the short answer there. So there's a lot of complexity that you could imagine trying to capture all the various elements, so no, we haven't tried to do that. Um, are we interested in studying smaller teams? Yes. I mean, to the extent that you're, you care about security and that's something that you're trying to do, that um, I think you have to be trying to do it. Otherwise, if you're studying it and you're not even trying, I don't think you can learn much from the study, right? <laughs> so one of the things, like, there's certain things that are difficult to study in small teams, but one of the nice things about a small team, uh, if you have a very cooperative small team, um, then what you could do is you could study their code development and look at, let's say, security weaknesses in their code, and then do an intervention, do training, right? Or or, or do something. Refactor Change, your code base. Refactor your code base. Or introduce you know, Slack or take Slack away. Right? And, and, then, uh, and then see the before and after or, effects. You know, make non-interrupted Tuesdays. You know? like some organizations do that where you, know, you have no meeting Tuesdays. So that allow people that uninterrupted time right? because of distraction. And then each developer is basically their own control. Right? So you look at the developer's code on non-interrupted Tuesday versus on meeting Wednesday. What code? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> There's no code on meeting Wednesday. Okay. Uh, so two questions. First one, uh, Chris had mentioned a attitudes questionnaire. Is that publicly available? Where would I find that? So we have a, a security questionnaire that we just developed. So it's, in, mm -hmm. it's actually in uh, what's called Institutional Review Board Review right now. Um, okay. I just got an email with some things I have to clarify. <laughs> okay. So we have that. So safety attitudes, as it turns out, we tried to actually adapt that survey initially and just use it for security, and I think it's inadequate, right? So we did a literature review of uh, culture. There's a lot of complexity there. So we've got a new one that we'd like to try out. That's, we're not going to publicize that, but uh, if you'd like to work with us, um, we could do it that way. Okay. Yeah. I'll... Uh... We might, and the, the second question was um, VMware. Oh, excellent. And the, the second question was, uh, so there were a lot of different measures here. Has there been any work on looking at how the relationships within members of a team might affect code quality, whether it's uh, uh, psychological diversity or <laughs> any, any other factors like that, more, more of these soft factor, factors that are presumably harder to measure? So the, I would say the culture survey that we've got measures a lot of different things. I mean, we've got it. I'm, it's, it's a 105 item questionnaire. It's got a bunch of different categories. I don't have them all memorized, right? But we have everything in there from individual things about attention to detail to group dynamic things. Well, and, and other types of attitudes like, are you an evidence-driven organization, right? Like when you're making decisions, do you make it based on gut instinct or are you looking for measurement, right? And that's sort of a total quality measurement kind of idea. Uh, we have a lot of other things in there that I, could, I can show it to you and we can just cover those categories. So I want to make a, a, a comment because this uh, gentleman was at a previous um, presentation on diversity and I got up because I wanted to make a comment and you know, people talk about diversity and how important it is. And, 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 and I was asked about a year and a half ago to participate in a panel on diversity and how you know, wonderful it is for teams. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I have, a psych I have a scientific bent to me. So let me just look at the literature on this and see if this doesn't really make a difference. And, um, and so there were three things. Right? Um, first of all, that cognitive diversity makes a difference. Forget about whether or not it's men, women, you know, ethnic origin, whatever, it's cognitive diversity. But then I looked specifically at software engineering and found that personality diversity on a software development team makes a difference in the quality of the code. And then finally, when you look at software engineering, you get very, not very good code if you have um, psychological fear that what you really have to have is a team where you have psychological safety, where somebody feels as though they could say, well, maybe we shouldn't do it that way. You know, maybe we do this and not be afraid of being called out for it or. It's one of the key things we have in our cultural survey too. <laughs>
Yeah, and just uh, my own personal experience, just anecdotal here. I mean, I've worked in all engineering organizations before, and I once commented in an extra inter exit interview about the lack of diversity, and they, they like jumped down my throat. They're like, no, we have very big diversity here. I was like, no, you're all engineers. And they're like, oh, well, you need to write that. <laughs> because they, they were taking it to mean like skin color and gender and all that other stuff, right? And I was saying, no, but you all think exactly the same, right? And so I, just my own personal experience, it really matters. Thank you very much for your attention.